Good morning. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Awake. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's the idea really going to sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Am I the only one so far? I guess so. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to grab the sandwich then. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Hello, my uncle. Hello. How are you? Yeah, I've been taking a break lately. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I want to see who is available to have a meeting. Only a couple people here. I had to switch the time uh, for fall, for fall, uh, you know, fall starting up. So, three degrees centigrade here. <laughs> it's sunny. Three degrees centigrade. Oh yeah. <laughs> Not sunny. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. I will see who all shows up, but welcome to the meeting. Uh, anyone have any news or comments to make about anything? Or yeah, we probably should have a one-on-one -on -one about note to get it started. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, how was noon today? Your time. Uh, I guess that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So this is just to show how it works and everything, or to get it started for. Yeah, get it started and see if we can get it. See if we get the online version going. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, I think both both of us are missing some holes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about you, Mayuk? What's been going on on your end? You've been taking a break from things. Yeah, but you repeat that actually my speaker is not working well. Oh, uh, I said, are you, you said you were taking a break from things? <laughs> you said speaker is not working well. Oh, okay. Yes, you're right. You still have an Indian accent. <laughs> oh, there's Ajwa, actually. So, there's Ajwa. Hello, Ajwa. Hello. Hi. Hey. Well, I completely forgot that time you should come over there. So yeah, no. Sorry for the. <laughs> yeah, I switched. Well, I had to switch it. Um, it's better. And then uh, we're gonna have the time change in a couple months, so that'll always it always has a bit of a 
problem there too. So uh, it's okay. So how are you doing after post uh, GSOC? Uh, pretty good. Like uh, now, our lectures have also been resumed. I have taken a few neural network courses in my college. So okay. like, just before this meeting, I have to do a lecture for this. Yeah, that sounds good. So uh, I don't think anyone else is going to show up. I had a couple, well, I have a couple things for today, I guess. Uh, I was going to talk about open projects. I uh, was hoping a couple more people would show up, but that's okay. We can do it on a recording on the, on the internet and, um, you know, people will see it. I just wanted to go over what was open. Uh, so let's see. Let me present now. I made a couple slides for this. I just wanted to recap what we have open. Okay, so you can see my screen here. Yes, and another message. Mayuk, what about the periodicity in the embryo thing? We we're planning about it during GSOC. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that and maybe some other projects. So let me go to present. So this is the follow up on Diva Worm proposed projects. We have uh, a couple of projects that I listed. There are probably more, but these are the ones that I, I kind of came up with at the top of my head that we've talked about maybe recently or over the summer uh, and just kind of like uh, doing like, in, you know, getting the stage where we talk about it and then we maybe put a little bit of, you know, time into it and then it's still open. So, I mean, you know, one way to make sure you complete projects is to keep putting them, you know, in your face and making, reminding yourself that they're there. And so that's a good strategy. Uh, so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk a little bit about each of these and maybe, you know, just keep reminding us that they're there. So let's see, I have six that I've counted. And there are more, I think, but I don't know. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at our conversations from the summer to remember. Uh, so the first one is the Lagrangian embryo, which we talked about maybe like two weeks ago. Um, and then I have this column called applications, which means that we have some other initiative that we're, that we've sort of, it follows up on a theme that we've, um, maybe I should have put themes in there, but uh, it follows up on a theme that we've discussed in the group. So there's this complexity measures theme that the Lagrangian embryo fits into, and there are probably other themes as well. Um, then we have Bacillaria psychophysics and collective pattern generators, which are both in the Bacillaria theme. Uh, periodicity of the embryo, which is complexity measures, and this is the one I mentioned. Um, axolotl virtual embryo, this is uh, more of a modeling theme, which is uh, the thing that uh, I've been talking about with Susan, and we've talked about... Um, a couple times in the meeting, we've shown the data a little bit. And then Devo Learn Build Out, which of course we know what that is. Uh, we've been successfully complete, we've successfully completed sort of the uh, build, you know, the build up of Devo Learn, the repository, the organization, everything like that. But now we're built, we want to build it out. We want to maybe add some more features and actually get people to use it. And so that's, you know, that's its own sort of project. Um, it's going to be a little bit different than these because it won't require any real research. It just requires uh, maybe some community building, maybe some more to mouth and so forth. And so this column book chapter special issue, I have, at least two of these are marked for a book chapter or a special issue. And so we can revisit this table and add in things uh, as they uh, happen. 
So I, I think we had another uh, message in the chat, and it was, uh, Ojewell said, I have started working on the Axolotl 3D image formation. Maybe I can talk about my progress in coming weeks. Yeah, that would be great. Um, just, you know, we can talk about it in Slack. We can, we can preview it, and then we can put it on the schedule for one of the coming meetings. Sure. Let me change this now while I'm thinking about it. All right. So that's... So these fit maybe fit into more than one theme, but I just wanted to get us started with that. Okay. Uh, one comment. Uh, okay. Uh, you might check with Thomas Harbich on whether he's made some progress on the stucco physics article. Okay. Sure. Yeah, with data collection and that. I'm just taking a note here. So, yeah, this this will require, yeah, people to communicate, of course, offline. So we'll do that. So the first one is Lagrangian embryo. And uh, this is something that Dick proposed a couple weeks ago. And, you know, we can think of this in terms of not necessarily cell tracking, but also trajectory divergence and convergence. So we can look at things like divergence of spatiotemporal flows fluid flows and then meso patterns, which is something that we've talked about in the uh, DevoLearn uh, software in terms of meta features. So being able to extract those features would help in terms of not just the cell tracking aspect, but the extraction of meta features would help in this uh, initiative. And this, these are just some diagrams I drew of like some flows um, and so that's that's one project that's on sort of just kind of starting out. Um, I think for this, we might need some, you know, we have some of the tools that we might need. Uh, then may, maybe we need some measures, some sort of, you know, form mathematical formulations or some simulations um, to see this through. And I... You know, I mean, we can use a, a variety of different techniques. It's not just, um, you know, maybe ones that we know, but also we can get people from outside and bring them into the conversation on it. Um, so that's the first one. The second one is the Basel area psychophysics. So this is the one that, uh, so we have the two Basel area papers. This is the one I think that we talked about, I showed you the uh, the abstract that was submitted for a book chapter on this. And this is the uh, GitHub repo for this. And we, so basically we have a cell colony, which is a non-neuronal system. So it's not a, not doesn't have a nervous system. It doesn't have a brain. But nevertheless, it's an information processing entity. That's kind of the argument. And then the argument is, is that you can use psychophysical measures or psychophysics to understand some of this information processing. So psychophysics is a form of looking at like how uh, they, they've done a lot of tests in humans, but also other animals and nervous systems, looking at how they can perceive things like differences in the number of items in a spatial array. So in this case, you have uh, what they call just noticeable difference. If I give you this array of 10 dots versus 20 dots, can you detect a difference between the two? If I flash them quickly in front of you, if I, if I show you this array versus this array, well, it's easy to see that there are more dots in this array than in this array. However, if you look at this array versus this array, 110 to 120, the order of magnitude is less, the increase between 110 and 120 is less than 10 to 20 because 10 to 20 is a doubling and 110 to 120 is not, you know, it's just a, a little bit more. And so I can show you these two arrays and it's much harder for you to detect the difference if I show it to you maybe in a couple seconds. 
And so those are types of things that you look at in psychophysics as their, you know, physical at attributes to the stimulus. And then there's some characteristic response. And so this may seem very far removed from uh, Basilaria, but there are things we can do with, look, you know, using some of these uh, measurement techniques to understand maybe what's going on with the movement of the colony and the coordination of the colony and so forth. And then the question is, is do these behaviors represent autonomous intelligence or does it simply mimic intelligent behavior? And so that would be another thing like to discuss in the paper, which would be, you know, does this represent like something like a brain or is it something that just mimics what a brain does? And it's just kind of this, you know, you can think of like a pendulum being something that mimics say human walking um you you know humans walk and we have a nervous system that controls walking um and there are also physical constraints that are involved in that but a pendulum doesn't have any sort of nervous system and it can do very similar things so that's the that's then the thing we would consider because you you know to apply something like this it's kind of a um, it's kind of controversial unless you really consider that as well. So, um, and I know that uh, Jesse had expressed some interest in this uh, project, but also Thomas Harbick is also involved in collecting a lot of the data for the uh, for the Basilaria, and we'll have to get have to get back with him and see where he is on generating data. And then we can go forward. And I think there, I don't know what the, I don't know if there's a hard deadline right now. I think it's next year where we have to do, uh, produce a manuscript. So we've got a bit of time on that, but it's still, you know, we want to be able to get it uh, man under control, you know, we want to make sure it's manageable. And that means we have to... We are looking at in the previous uh, the previous generation which we have worked on uh, on Basilaria. So it is kind of a video where the walls are being uh, like elongated and like compressing. So like these there's a kind of data that we are going to use in this paper as well or there is some other kind of data. I, could you repeat that? Oh uh, just a second. Okay. Oh, am I all right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so basically I'm saying like oh, we have oh, already brought on the Basilaria uh, data set before. Yeah. And like it is kind of a, a video like showing elongation and like contraction in the Basilaria uh, diagram. So like this time we are also going to work with the same kind of data set or we have a different data set because to know like intelligent or autonomous intelligence we need to like some data where if um, object is in the path so it is like kind of moving around or not so like i don't know i'm thinking like if it is on that point yeah well i mean there is you know we have just a little bit of data about movement and so hello how are you uh and so we have this these movement data and we don't but we don't from the uh paper that we did, we don't have a lot of data. Uh, you know, we'd like to have more data generated. And uh, as for like formal experiments, I'm not really sure if that's what we can get. Um, not really sure if you can do a, like an experimental intervention that's uh, suitable for what we want. Maybe just like recordings of behavior, maybe more data in terms of the variety of behaviors or, uh, you know, just more data in general will give us some indication. Because, I mean, like in the pap in the previous paper, we had uh, s uh, some simple tracking information so we could see the contraction and expansion of the colony. Um, so this is, okay, what is this? So this is actually a paper that, uh, so this, Dick, this is the one that he's, preparing for this book chat for this book volume so it wasn't white people that's why they didn't say their name and it didn't make national news yes. well, it's what we did on CBC, just 
And so, yeah, this is this paper that Thomas Harbick is preparing for uh, this. Uh, this is the same book chapter that the uh, machine learning paper is going into. But this is uh, this. I don't know if we have access to this or not. So we can maybe get get a handle, uh, get a get access to this paper, and look at the data that are that he's collected so far. And he'll collect more data because he's been culturing his. Uh, Okay, we can ask Thomas directly. We can ask uh, and see what he has in terms of data and uh, of this paper. So, so I mean, I hope that we, you know, um, we should be able to do something with the data. We just have to like get a, uh, you know, start analyzing it and seeing what we can do with it. So, um, yeah. So let me go back to this uh, presentation. So this is the uh, this is the paper psychophysics. So you can see that we have a GitHub repo as well. So this is this GitHub repo is basically the open paper. So right now it's this uh, abstract that needs to be filled out. Um, I don't really have. <clears throat> Much more than the abstract here in this repo. Let's see if I can open it up. So this is the the open papers here. This is the uh, abstract. It has, we have some references. We have this, uh, like a list of measurement techniques. Right now, this is just an outline, but you know, as we go through, we can, uh, so the idea would be that we would hypothesize that the uh, bacillary has this internal model with inputs, outputs, processing units, you know, within the colony and interactions between the different cells. And so then certain behaviors should conform to a statistical regularity, some sort of output function that we can characterize. And that's based, and then we'd use one of these methods. Uh, we could look at like the detection of stimulus or we could even look at like its own movement and that's that's i think the place where you know maybe there's a little bit of uh people would throw up a challenge and say well you're not really looking at stimuli directly and so you could say well you know we there you know we're, we're there are ways you know we can just measure the the output data and say that this behavior is you know that there's some regularity in behavior or something that's that's basically what uh, psychophysics is. And so, uh, so this is the abstract. And again, if you want to look it over, here is the link. So Dick says, could also pulse light in synchrony or locally using fiber optics. Interventions for bacillaria. Turn off lights and they go to closest configuration with cells touching whole lengths. Increase light that speed up. Well, yeah, we could do light stimuli. Yeah, so I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't really sure what the, uh, the sorts of things that people tend to look at with respect to behavioral variability. So pulse light sync. Just taking notes again. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if uh, even I'm making sense or not, but uh, when I was uh, looking at the data of Bacillaria, there are some videos which are on the background, and there are some videos which have a uh, different background, like uh, some light in the background. Mm -hmm. and I don't know, like, uh, there is certain difference between these two Bacillaria diagrams. Like, the one in the black is very much elongated, and the uh, one in the bright light is somewhat uh, compact in shape. So, I don't know if like, this is something uh, the light similar is. Yeah. Well, we'll have to, yeah, we'll have to talk about this more uh, when we get, like, when we start negotiating, you know, what the data are going to look like. So, if, if okay. Thomas can get us some data, I mean, we can do some, I can discuss it with him and we can make a kind of a 
you know, maybe we'll get a couple of conditions where, you know, the light's variable or something like that. And that'll be, that'll be an interesting, uh, you know, set of analysis. So, so all these things, yeah, I took notes on all this. This is the repository. This is the link. Um, if you want to know more and if you're offline, this is the link to the document or you can ask me in Slack or email. So that's the psychophysics uh, paper. So something that's a little less far along and maybe this will be something we can use as, uh, the same data set or the data set that we have now on is this idea of collective pattern generators in Vassalaria. And this might actually require a little bit more simulation work. So um, and this is the repo for this. This is the same repo. I didn't put the dot in here, but it's the same place. It's just a different folder. Um, and this is, uh, so this is a cell colony again, a non-neuronal system as an information processing entity. And this is an example of a collected or a, a, a central pattern generator, which is where you have an organism that has like a set of excitable cells or neurons and they generate this uh, movement and they, like this tail flicking behavior. And it's rhythmic in the sense that it has this regular irregularity to it. So in these, uh, I think this is a tadpole and then in the uh, in the adult or later in development, they have this hind limb central pattern generator that's synchronized across muscles. And so this is the way you get a lot of movements in um, a, a wide range of organisms. Uh, C. elegans has central pattern generators for generating um, their movements. It's just a collection, it's just like a small network of neurons that generate something that's a regular pulse. Your heart rate or your heartbeat is actually managed by a, a set of central pattern generators so that the, the rhythm is always there. It's not lost and it's not something that happens as an emergent phenomenon. So that's the idea of a central pattern generator, but a collective pattern generator then is something that happens amongst a bunch of cells that maybe are in a nervous system, but they still generate this rhythmic pattern. And that's the sort of thing, basically the question is, does Bacillary demonstrate a non-neuronal analog to this central pattern generator? And so actually this should be COPGs, but the, the yeah, so CPGs are, are central pattern generators, collective pattern generators are COPGs. And so that's the, the idea behind that. And so the question is, is that do COPGs as something that's not a CPG, but based loosely on that same analogy, reflect adaptive control or are they simply an output of the behavior? And so, you know, it's, it's the difference there is that do they represent some sort of adaptive control in terms of like uh, synchronizing with the environment or are they just simply this output you can simulate invariant of the environment? If you put it in one environment versus another, it's the same thing. And so that's, uh, you know, maybe more of a theoretical question, um, but that's that's the idea. So again, this is the link to this paper. Okay, um, and then this. So this is the document, and this is actually even in less uh, complete shape than the other one. This is an outline mainly. Um, so central pattern generators generate oscillations from a small neural circuit. But in these, in a best where we observe something we're proposing is called collective pattern generators, which are generated from collective and coordinated behavior. The central nervous system or brain is involved. And then this kind of gives you this aneural architecture. Um, and then how to model. So, it's, you know, you model sort of this movement, basic movement as a set of sine waves that overlap. And then, so we actually have a CPG. I have data on CPGs from a stick insect. These are what they call synergistic CPGs. And so this, this paper has a data set that's open 
that we can analyze um, and, you know, maybe compare with the simulation of Bacillaria. And then uh, maybe there's some analysis we can use, discussion. And so that's, that's that idea. Um, so let's see. I uh, really want to fix something here. Okay. Um, so then we go on to the next one, which is periodicity in the embryo. This is the one that uh, Mayuk was talking about. So this again it has a, a GitHub repo where some of this, these materials live. And so the periodicity, of course, is that you have this embryo, and this is a zebrafish that I've uh, thrown into the slide, a zebrafish embryo going from a two-cell stage to a 256-cell stage. And this is the zebrafish embryo. I think I showed you a three-dimensional um, cell tracking uh, reconstruction where it had kind of like the cells on the edge, and then there was like this gap. So it kind of looked like a crescent or an open-ended sphere. And so that comes from this uh, body at the bottom. So these cells bud at the top of the, at the embryo, and they sort of, this is where all the cells are. And so it's a little bit different than C. elegans. C. elegans is that one, you know, it's the egg and then things develop within the bounds of the egg. And the zebrafish, it's a little bit different. Um, so this is the morphology of the embryo. But then what we can do with the cell tracking data is, and this is a zebrafish adult, we can look at the division times uh, across development. And so there's a, a lot of data here. Um, it's from different, many different developmental stages. But this is basically the first stage of development from 0 to 210 minutes. And so there we see that there's this regularity, these pulses of divisions that occur. And we see this in C. elegans as well, um, that they don't, it's not, you know, uniform with respect to time. Like not, you know, you don't get the same number of cells every minute. You get these, these, uh, you know, waves of cell division and it breaks down a little bit out here. But what you can do is you can uh, bin these um, division events and you can look at like these little, you know, you can look at the local maximum of the number of division events over time. And so that's how we did this graph here, where you have that you take all these data where you have these different, uh, you know, peaks in cell division. And then you look at the periodicity between the peaks. So between this peak and this peak represents maybe about, uh, maybe 15 minutes, I don't really know. But this is what you end up with. You end up with these graphs where there are intervals between these peaks. And so you can see there are a lot of peaks in the lower end of the spectrum, and that represents a lot of these, this area here. And then you have a couple out here, which are, you know, 16 to 22 minutes. And that's these, these areas over here. So it's the sort of frequency domain analysis this is actually somewhat crude, but it actually gets at the structure a bit. And so the idea would be in, in this paper would be to uh, explore some of these trends for different species. And so we have zebrafish data, we have C. elegans data, and that that's a good comparison. Uh, just if you want to do like a cross species comparison, but maybe there are other, well, maybe just leave it at zebrafish to see elegans. Um, that might just be sufficient. But anyways, that's the kind of analysis we can do. And there might be some more analyses of the data we can do as well. Um, this is, again, where this lives. So if we go into this here, uh, this is, I remember that we talked about this several weeks ago, and we have this outline, but we, also, and there have been a couple additions to this since. So the C. elegans, there's a, an analysis uh, where we have the intervals here. And then for zebrafish, we have a map of the intervals here. Okay, and, Bradley, uh, do we have a target list to publish this? 
Uh, well, this was something that was going to go into the uh, the special issue last year that got canceled. So I think this is something oh, that might not, go. Not, yeah, uh, it can go in. We we have restarted that as a special issue of Biosystems. Yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. Yeah, that's that's going. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is there some deadline we need to be aware of in terms of the sometime uh, sometime next year? Okay, so there's no uh, proposal that's needed, or I'll, I don't think so. I'll see if I can find the call for papers. Okay, so thank you. Um, yeah, so this is you know, as you notice, this is another one with one of the whys in the special issue category. So this is something that we can submit to this biosystems issue. And this is something that we, this is actually something that came from the proposal for the special issue when it was with Frontiers and it got uh, it got delayed, I guess, so. Um, yes, Luigi was sick. Yeah, yeah, one of the collaborators was sick. And so this, well, you know, we'll try to uh, get this into better shape over again. This is going to be, you know, we're just going to have to keep revisiting it and, uh, tightening it up and figuring out like what we have in terms of an argument in terms of like the comparisons, the comparative for some of you who have not done any comparative work before. This is an interesting area where you can take two organisms that are, you know, quite different in their say development or in other ways, and you can find commonalities between them. And, you know, with, with this ability to find, uh, you know, this ability to do cell tracking and things like that, it makes it much easier to do. Um, because, you know, if you were just doing this by eye or some other method, it would be very hard to get to find, you know, commonalities in these things. And so this 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 draft is, uh, we not only have this, but we also have a, I think something on Google Drive that describes the, uh, so the roles people want to play. So we have a, I don't know if we have a, a place for this. Um, I think I did have a folder here one time. I put in the URL for the call for papers. Okay, let's see. All right, there's the call for papers. So well, anyways, there's a folder, there's some document that I, I created that describes sort of the roles that people have said they might want to play. So I think it might be in here. No, it isn't. Okay, so I'll, I I can recirculate that, uh, that document where people said they might want to do something. If you're interested, again, remind me. Um, get in my face about it. <laughs> That's the, the name here. Uh, so this is waves and fertilization, cell division, and embryogenesis. This is the special issue of biosystems. And so we have uh, the life cycle of eukaryotes involves an al uh, alternation of haploid and diploid stages. In multicellular eukaryotes, discoveries of activation waves, mitotic waves, imaginal disc furrows, calcium waves, and differentiation waves suggest that more is going on than differential gene expression. Uh, where are we? Oh, as an organism starts from the one cell zygote through cell division, embryogenesis, and maturity. Well, that's what we just saw. While the bottom-up approach of a molecular developmental biology has yielded a richness of biochemical mechanisms, it has not shown how these are organized in space and time. Research on these various waves point a way to bridging the gap between the molecular level and whole organism. The fundamental act in the fertilization process involves the interaction of the spermatozoan with the egg cortex, resulting in various waves that propagate along the cortex. Depending on the species, the activated spermatozoan is the ability to fertilize the oocytes. And then indicating that the fertilizable conditions are correlated with the structural organization of the egg cortex at the time of fertilization. So when I say cortex, I don't mean like the brain, I mean there's a special technical term and development of the egg. Um, and so then that's that's basically the call for papers. And we have one paper here already, French fly gradients and turning reaction diffusion versus differentiation waves as models of morphogenesis. 
So that's uh, scheduled for October. Um, and then there will be more papers in this issue as they become submitted and, and available. So, uh, so yeah, we would submit to this and then we'd get some uh, peer review feedback. And then we would, uh, you know, hopefully this becomes a paper in this issue. And so, I mean, that's, that's I read all of that just to make people aware of kind of where this is headed and what's, what's involved in this. And I think like in our computational approach, I think it's very valuable uh, like I said, you know, with cell tracking and especially with the ability to analyze cell tracking data, it opens up a lot of avenues for comparative stuff. So that's the uh, oh, that's the periodicity in the embryo. And again, we can talk more about that um, as we go along. Uh, then the axolotl digital modeling. So this is the uh, thing that we've talked about with Susan a couple times. And for those of you who haven't seen the data, uh, this is actually, if you recall, we talked about this in some of the meetings. This is where we have this microscope that takes these axolotl embryos. So this is an axolotl down here. Uh, and it takes the egg and it flip. it basically uh, pulls it down and then it, it releases the egg and it flips. So it goes through it goes through a water column and it gets released and it flips. It turns over. So you can see these images. These are images from one of the series that were collected by Susan. And you have this egg and these images basically show the thing rotating in this direction. So you start with this uh, image and then it moves these are the same cells you can kind of make them out as they're moving across the surface this is just the rotation it's kind of like looking at a, a basketball or a soccer ball as it's rotating you can see like the markings on it move you know as it's moving if you took a bunch of still shots of the movement and you would see that they change position now the, the idea here is to take this and to project it onto something like a sphere so there's some map projection algorithm that needs to be applied to these data. So we can take the image, and this is a, a square image as a raw image, and then we can segment it using a, a, a circular mask to pull that out of the background and, and just kind of make sure that they're normalized. So they're mostly, when you do the, actually you can do the, uh, segmentation by hand and just by looking at the sort of the edge and you can see that you mostly get something that's equivalent to crossed images so it's about the same size so there might be an automated way to do that that would make it a little bit more efficient but you do end up with this nice spherical shape you know so you don't probably have a lot of post-processing there the challenge is to project it to some sort of uh, three-dimensional model using a map projection algorithm. So I understand that uh, Ojewal said that he was doing some work on this because I sent the, I put the data, uh, some sample data in a folder and I wanted Mayo and Ojewal to take a look. And I guess Ojewal said he had uh, some ideas about it or I don't know if that's something you want to follow up on now. I mean, we can talk about it in the coming weeks, but. So yeah, basically, I'm also exploring the same, on the same pattern. Like I have working on two, two sides. Like first, simple the map projection algorithms to construct a 3D uh, image. Second is I'm trying to do this uh, because like, as you have said, like, you have support on the plane map and if you're using a model, so you not easy to like support on browsers sorry browsers so i'm trying to do it on blender as well uh, there are some uh, support in blender for the time container series to make 3d models so let's see if i have an update in the okay yeah yeah well i look forward to that and uh so it says susan is constructing a new microscope based on nine microscopes around the embryo so this is, I guess, flipping it in different directions, or is it just to get them all around? Uh, this. Okay. <laughs> so you just get that 
multi-dimensional view. Well, while it will prove to presumably it will also be uh, turned upside down. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's another source of data. Yeah. So this looks pretty uh, interesting. She sent me. She sent me one microscope. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, this is the idea here is to get a full view of the embryo for all sides of it. So like a lot of the. Uh, the C. elegans stuff, you know, they take an embryo and they put it on a slide and it's like one, like you can see through the embryo, you can do like a s series of a stack of images so you can do slices through the embryo through by, you know, changing the focal plane. And well, you not, get a bunch of... not really because they're visually opaque. Okay. Yeah. So you don't get a lot. I mean, you get some resolution, but it's limited. But you only get like one at one view of it, so you get like it limits basically what we know about the shape of the cells. I mean, we can see like the you know I, I know that those of you who have worked with cell tracking data and cell segmentation know that you have the images where you can detect the edges of the cells. But in this case, we'd be getting like multi-dimensional information about the edges. And then, you know, trying to, re you know, if you want to reconstruct something, it's much more accurate to do that. And you can get at areas of the embryo that are hard to see otherwise. So, so that's uh, the digital modeling. And then finally, and I'll present back in present mode for this, is the DevoLearn build out. And so, like I said, we have this great tool, DevoLearn. Uh, accelerating data-driven developmental biology research with computational learning models. And so we've gotten some exposure out in the community. Um, there have been a couple people who have inquired about contributing, but we'd really like people to use it uh, for analysis and for other things. And so, again, this is, uh, you know, a series of models. So we have this DevoLearn uh organization on GitHub. Within that, we have living uh, the DevoLearn program, so it's like a pre-trained model. We have species-specific models, uh, which is a Steve Orm AI, and then DevoZoo, which is the sort of like the data sets and all these things. So we have like this basically this pipeline where someone could take some data, they could find a data set, they could apply these algorithms to it, and they could get this analysis of an embryo. But we can do much more. We can actually do things like, uh, you know, with the axolotl, in the axolotl case, you know, we might have some uh, 3D digital modeling involved, and we could have that as another part of this. We also have the education component, which is the uh, DevoWorm, OpenWorm curriculum or things that people, we have data science tutorials that people have made uh, so those are all things that, you know, we can point people to and say, look, you know, we've got all these nice tools that, you know, if you want to learn about this topic, it's like a one-stop shop. You have uh, all these different things that you might need to learn about. We can demonstrate an analysis uh, and then, or you can just use it as an analysis in its own right if you want to analyze some data and you already kind of know what you're doing, <laughs> then you can just do the analysis. So it's really, uh, I think it's going to be like a nice component um, of all of this. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the the only thing is, you know, we just have to find people to contribute maybe like as users or not just as like people who make things, but also as users. And um, we'll see how that goes. Um so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I know I'm probably forgetting a lot, maybe a couple of things on here. Um, there are things under, like say, DevoLearn that are sort of de maybe deserve their own line, but we don't, you know, that's not something that I think we've talked about very much. So um, my suggestion here, instead of letting this list proliferate, is to focus on some of these things more directly and see what we can accomplish out of the fall. Boring Billion might be on the list. Okay. So uh, what is the status of Boring Billion?
Okay. Well, I'll have to check with George then. Yeah. I haven't uh, discussed it with him, but that'll be that'll be something. We'll, we'll see how that goes. It's a, this is a different uh, topic that I don't know. Well, I guess it's pretty relevant to the group. Um, the boring billion is this idea that life started at, yeah, I think four o'clock. Yeah. So life started and then for like about a billion years, there wasn't very much going on. Um, and then there was this explosion of biodiversity. And then the question is, why is it that there was this long period of, I don't know if it's stasis, but definitely like compared to what's happened since the explosion, what, you know, why, why was there that huge uh, length of time? And so that's, I mean, that's something that isn't directly related to what we're kind of doing in this group, but it's, you know, it's uh, something that you might be interested in. Um, yeah, as well, this already sounds interesting. So it's, it's really not, I mean, this thing with George is, I don't know if it's, uh, something that is, I don't even know what it really is yet in terms of action items, but uh, we'll we'll bring it up in future meetings. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, am I not? Are you there? I was wondering if he wanted to introduce himself and talk about uh, if he found things interesting. I know he's been in the Slack channel. Okay. So Dick says that the question in terms of the boring billion or the scientific question is, why did it take 1 billion years to get from one cell eukaryotes to many cell eukaryotes, the Cambrian, the Cambrian explosion? So yes, yeah, so for a long time, life existed as these one cell uh, eukaryotes. We had eukaryotes and prokaryotes, but then you don't have multicellularity until much later. And then that's kind of the question. And there have been a lot of people who've explored sort of multicellular transitions or they call them the major transitions in evolution, but um, you know that's you know there are a lot there's a lot to explore there. So it's that's basically what's related to. Okay. okay. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments? Okay, I gotta go. Okay. okay, see you later. Dude. Thanks for attending. Yeah, bye. Okay, so everyone have a good week. Uh, if you, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Talk to you later.